So what makes Switzerland so innovative? I had a, it's a funny question, and uh, I will give you some more insights during that talk. I had a conversation yesterday with another speaker, and we, we talked about, yeah, where are we from? So I said, Switzerland. And so he said, yeah, you have the banks, you have the money, you have the mountains and the cheese. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good. And uh, he, he works in the European tech scene, but then he asked me, so, so startup-wise, tech-wise, what do you have? And um, I thought it's a little bit a paradox. So I'm on stage telling you how innovative Switzerland should be, but uh, he doesn't even know. So uh, I hope after this talk you know more and uh, you know one of the reasons why it's not so well known. Um, maybe for a starter, does anyone know the background picture? Where is that from or what's that thing in the back? Hey, perfect. So you know, you, you're already set up. So this is exactly CERN. Uh, it's in Geneva and it's the biggest uh, physical molecule laboratory in the world. Uh, it's incredible what they do. They're really pushing the, the tech of tomorrow. And I'm always fascinated when I meet entrepreneurs and startups from that area that now start their own business. I normally don't understand their tech, but I hope one day I will. And that's a little bit the, the difficult part about Switzerland. So why is it not so well known? It's a lot about really deep tech invention and a lot in the B2B sector, but more to that in my talk. So that's the normal picture. Uh, I normally present Switzerland and I thought, so since we, it's not so well known that we do a lot of tech, uh, let's switch it around. But that's normally what I show, beautiful mountains, the Matterhorn. And uh, I brought you some fun facts about Switzerland. So we're 8.3 million people, almost twice the size of Georgia. It's the, the first time I can say we're bigger than someone. It's normally us who are the, the smallest, at least when I present. Uh, so I know how it feels. And uh, for a small country, it's always difficult because you don't have a huge domestic market, so not too many people are just coming for you and say, yeah, we want to start a business in Georgia or in Switzerland, since 8 million or 3.5 million people is just a small market worldwide. Um, we have four national languages. doesn't make things easier. It's quite tough. Uh, I don't speak all of them, fortunately or unfortunately, but the common denominator nowadays is English, since I think everyone realized that it's you don't have to give something up or you don't have to hold back, but everyone is happy to speak English and it's hard enough for, for everyone. Another fun fact, we have the highest chocolate consumption. Uh, I like that fact and I, I blame it on the good chocolate. Uh, it's actually super delicious, so um, if you dare, come and try. And now we're getting down to the point. So it's also home of inventions such as the internet, absent, and E equals MC squared. So, that, no, maybe, maybe think a little bit, it makes tick. So it's a lot of things happening in Switzerland, invented in Switzerland, but it's mostly inventions. And I think we're good at that. What we're not so good at yet is telling the story and commercialize it. That normally happens somewhere else in the world, but I'm still happy that uh, it started there. So today's talk is about building ecosystems. And before I start, I, I want to dig into that term a little bit. It's, it's widely used. Everyone talks about ecosystems and no one really understands them. But, uh, and that's exactly the point. In my eyes, ecosystems are highly complex. You have Silicon Valley, you have Israel, you have China, you have, maybe you have Switzerland. And um, they all do great. And you go there, you travel there, you see what they do and you try to replicate it. So a couple of years ago, everyone tried to build the next Silicon Valley. Who succeeded? Almost no one, since it's so difficult to replicate an ecosystem. It's so many factors and so much timing that takes into place. Replicate, like, to replicate something like that entirely is, in my eyes, pretty much impossible. But what you can do is go there and learn. Take what you think makes sense or what you think didn't make sense and adapt it to your local uh, customs. And um, I'll tell you a story of this summer. We went to Israel and we met uh, Igil Elric. He's the founding father of the Yosma project. And the Yosma project started almost 30 years ago. It was um, when Israel, back then, they didn't have any, any startups or any startup industry. But they wanted to start it and they needed VC capital, so venture capital, to invest in these companies. So what he did, he came up with an idea that every VC who wants to start, gets half of his funds. So if he wants to raise 20 millions, the state puts in 10 millions. 
and he just has to raise the other 10 million. Yeah. So it's a, it's a loan. If he's successful, he pays back with some interest. If he's not successful, that's it. Money is gone and he doesn't have to pay back. Highly successful. If you look at Israel now, they have five to six billion of VC capital spent per year. Um, but just to implement that, or just to adapt that to other ecosystems is quite difficult. Um, many try, not many succeed with it. And I just want to tell you that story to, to think a little bit about it. I think it's something that works really good and worked really good for Israel 30 years ago. During that time, there is nothing else around in an isolated market. But it's not so easy to just adapt it and multiply it at any given country or ecosystem. You really have to think about the incentive structures and maybe what changed since then or how is the market going to play out. Perfect. So uh, without, the, without further ado, uh, let's do a quick deep dive into Switzerland. And I'll try to give you some insights since I, I believe like Switzerland as Georgia, we, we lack on, on, on a big domestic market. We're a small country. We don't have any resources. So what do we have? And uh, that's a little bit what I want to try to tell you. So think about that USP or what, is, what makes you special and what can you do to bring to the world. Good. So I didn't know if I should put it in. As a Swiss, we're always quite modest and we don't want to brag. But uh, we got rated by the World um, Intellectual Property Organization as the most innovative country in the world. Um, for the ninth time now, I would say the statistics is a little bit biased since uh, it comes with a lot of IP rights and um, based on the fact, I'll tell you more about that later, that we've quite a lot of farmers and multinationals. Maybe it's a little bit inflated, but I think there is something to this statistic. That's why I wanted to put it up and uh, I think it, it matches with my pitch. So can to, can I have something to, to tell? It's not just me that thinks that way, it's, there's others as well. So what are these success drivers, or if you think about it, what could it be that makes countries successful and innovative and others not so much? And I mean, there's always various factors, but I try to narrow it down and uh, give you a quick insight what I think is, is important. Um, in my eyes, it's a lot about talent, and Talent is a lot in, in universities. So what Switzerland really has is, is world-class universities and talents. If, funny fact, if, you, if you're born in Switzerland and you go to university, you have a 50% chance to end up in the top 100 ranked university worldwide. So just this is, is ridiculous. And it's even affordable. So it's not like in, across the big pond where you leave your masters with half a million in debt. Now it's really affordable, so everyone should be able to take it. Um, beautiful thing there is, if it comes to talent, I wouldn't say it's Swiss, I would say it's really global. And that as well, if you look at ecosystems, where does innovation happen? It happens at some place where you bring bright talents from all across the world and bring them together to work on, on one specific thing. And that's exactly what's happening. ETH, EPFL, these are just hotspots that brings together the brightest minds and uh, lets them produce the next robot or lets them produce the next drone or save the next healthcare. So I think it's, it's more about that. You give them a stable place where they really can develop their talent. Next up, decentral hubs. Um, if you look at Switzerland, we were always quiet. We were never central organized. We always Wanted, everyone wanted to be its own thing. We have 26 cantons, and they all organize themselves. And um, if, you, if you look at it from a startup side, it's really interesting where you have these clusters. So the difficulty with 26, 26 cantons is everyone wants to promote themselves, and every, they all want to do the same thing. And it's interesting in the startup world as well. You have such trends as blockchain two years ago, or AI nowadays, all the countries and cities, they all want to brand themselves on the hottest topics. But I do believe you really have to rethink that. Is it really true that you're good at it? And is there more to it than just the trendy topic? So do you really have a USP, a strategic advantage that makes your claim right? And I mean, if you look at China, if they want to claim that or if they claim that, 
it kind of makes sense. They probably have the, the biggest pool of privacy data available you can crunch in and work with and have billions of capital flowing into this direction. So on that side, I guess they have quite a strong claim. And who else wants to jump on it? They really have to rethink. So what else do we bring? Do we bring something better or how should we position ourselves to do it? If you look at Switzerland now, you see a big hub around Zurich, and uh, it's in the startup scene, it's the same. We have a lot of startups. Most of them come from the Zurich area, uh, from ETH, which is one of uh, the leading tech universities in Europe and the world. And there you have a lot of companies coming from robotics or um, fintech. And that makes a lot of sense. So this focus for me works since you have a lot of big old legacy companies, a lot of multinational banks in the Zurich area. You have Souk, which is the crypto valley, just 30 minutes away. And uh, for me, that is a sounding, a, sounding, a sounding case. You can really say, hey, we have an advantage. We have the expert. We have the industry. And it's something people can profit from. And similar with Basel, they have incredible market for health tech. So with Novartis and Roche and um, many more. They have the expert there. They have the research there. So this is an interesting place to be. And that's what I always advise cities or countries when they want to be known for something. Reduce it to one or two things. So don't try to do everything. Um, and think what you really are truly better or where you really have a USP. So how can you position yourself that really differentiates you from all the other countries that want to be the best in AI, which for me is a technical layer. But, um, Really think about that, so focus is key. And that doesn't mean that you don't do the rest. So Zurich, you have a lot of robotic startups, but you have a lot of other startups as well. Focusing doesn't mean you don't do the rest. Next up, and that's what many of them don't know. So if you think about it, Switzerland is, we have a small domestic market, but we are number seven in number of uh, multinational headquarters. And that means it's quite an incredible hotspot when it comes to B2B business. So if you want to work together with bigger companies in the world, it's a good place to start and get the deals done. And that's exactly as well why Zurich is good for fintech, because you have many of these companies working there, and you have many of these experts already present. By the way, that's uh, Zurich, and uh, that's the Limat. So I live there. I like the city. And in summer, fun fact, you can actually go swimming in that thing. So that's if I have enough time, I always go for a hat dive in this in this beautiful place. Very good. Next up, venture capital. I already talked about that quickly. Um, if you look at this now, and if you look at the numbers in Switzerland, um, I, you see we, have a lot, we raised around 1.2 billion last year. You don't have all the numbers since some is diluted, they're not uh, acceptable. And we grow with around 30% year over year. I think it's an interesting metric because it shows you a lot about the maturity of an ecosystem. The more venture capital normally is around, the bigger the rounds get and the more scale-ups and big companies you get. Um, you see that with Israel, for example. They have like four times this number, but they of course started 15 years earlier as well. And what is, what is always happening, as soon as you have the first success cases, you will create new VCs and new money flowing in. So the hardest part is always to start because the money has to come from somewhere. And as soon as you get success cases, this inflates and it's just a, a self-running organ organism afterwards. Um, what I want to say with it, it's a great number and you need it to happen. Otherwise, without capital, nothing is going to change. Switzerland here, we're definitely not leading while we're growing and we think we're growing at a good pace. But uh, we're definitely not the world leaders in it. And that's exactly one of the challenges we face as an ecosystem. We don't have enough growth capital. But this to, to know this is already good because then you, you find solutions how to change it. Um, it's super small numbers, but I wanted to say with that one is, before I talked more about agnostic Switzerland, so where I think are the strengths, when you look at the dominant sectors in the startup ecosystem, you see that it kind of correlates with it. So we have most of the startups come from a uh, robotic software hardware uh, crossover sector. It means so much to put hardware and software into action. So it's a lot about robotics. It's a lot about drones. 
Um, and a lot of them, spin-offs come as well from ETH and EPFL, which kind of makes sense. So university-based spin-offs are a big thing. Then MedTech, as mentioned already, makes a lot of sense too, since Basel and to some extent Lausanne are big hubs for biotech and uh, health tech companies. So this is just how I want to show it's it's not that we we, we thought like you know, let's put fintech on the map or let's put math and health tech on the map. It's really that we thought where are we strong? And then we realized it's actually happening in these sectors as well. So that's that's interesting. If you have this this advantage or if you have this um, if you have a market and a, you and, and something valuable in this, the startups will follow it and the startups will see benefits in that as well and create these kind of companies. And as mentioned already, we're starting to become more and more uh, a scale-up company, which is cool. I think we started really 15 years ago. Nothing, not too much was happening back then. But now you see bigger and bigger rounds. I put the uh, Get Your Guide on it. They normally are mostly based in Berlin nowadays, but the headquarter is still in Switzerland, and it was founded in Switzerland as well. And I think that that's a little bit the way it should go. We're a small country. We want to keep the headquarters and we want to keep the people there, but they have to go global. Uh, next up, Sophia Genetics, that's uh, the funny thing with Swiss startups. Most of them are in health tech and biotech and almost no one knows them. They get sold for $500 million to some pharmaceutical company and you haven't even heard of it yet. And, um, but yeah, what I basically want to say is really what is interesting and important about the ecosystem, know and understand yourself first, think about what's your maturity rate, what is important now for the future, focus on what you're good at and what you can change across the world. That can mean uh, it can be an, uh, a regional cluster if you're really good for a specific region in, uh, in, in exchange or in bring tech abroad. What we're trying to do in Europe is that we're a good starting point to tackle the European market. Or what we really, what's interesting as well is the US and China a U.S. startup can't just go to China. It's they, they don't like each other too much at the moment. So what we're doing is we built uh, the neutral hub. So as a startup, you can be in Switzerland and tackle the U.S. and the Chinese market at the same time, which is normally not happening. They always do either way. And um, so, yeah, that's a little bit of thing. Um, that was most of uh, what I wanted to say. Now I give you a quick glimpse what I do at at Digital Switzerland, don't want to promote that too much, but um, why do we need us and why is it important? I put a lot of words on that, but what we basically are, we are a cross-industry, multi-stakeholder organization, a lot of buzzwords as well, but um, bottom line is Switzerland is super decentral, so you need a Swiss-wide um, glue that all sticks together, and that's pretty much what we do. We try to get all these contents aligned, and we really have to tell them as well not to push Zurich first, but to push the word of Switzerland first, because people might know Switzerland, but they don't know Zurich or they don't know Lausanne. But as soon as they're in Switzerland, they will go out in the regions that suits them best. So it's in their own interest to, to reduce that to a factor that makes sense. And we work across all the industries with corporates, politicians, multi-startups, uh, investors, and really try to shape that and bring Switzerland forward. I explained it to you in an example. Um, I think uh, this is a little bit too abstract, but um, what it actually means and what I, what I quite like and what I took a lot of learnings out of it as well, four or five years ago when we started, we looked at the Swiss ecosystem and we've seen there is almost no acceleration programs. And what we did, we initiated Kickstart Accelerator um, as one of the first. He did it quite classic, so basic American model, three months of training, uh, early, early stage startups, and so we tested that, and uh, I think we killed more startups than we helped, but, <laughs> but uh, the learning out of it was, was super successful. So we realized that. What we tried to do was introduce them to our corporate network and try to build a POC together. But the thing is, when you start to work with a big corporate multinational, um, you enter a B2B cycle. So that takes six to 18 months to just close a deal. And startups that haven't even been funded, like we don't have cash for the next six months, this is just not working. So we realized that's not for us. And we switched everything to a more scale-up orientated, 
more market entry faced Switzerland. And after two years, Kickstarter was so successful that many more joined. Um, we have a lot of acceleration programs nowadays, so we are not active anymore. Kickstarter is fully independent. And we really more try to do to share the learnings. And what I think is super interesting, um, this American model, who works really good for first time founders and to get speed and knowledge into the market, um, worked great then. Nowadays, they all focus more on building this um, entry point for scale-ups to Switzerland. So they have startups from 10 to 200 people coming and joining this program. It's not that they don't have to stay there for three months. It's normally just one or two weeks in a, in a certain period. And they give the intro. They explain what's happening. And uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, running over time. So I think that is a good example of how we challenged it. Thank you so much for listening. I was sorry that I delayed your Halloween fun, but uh, after this, I think it's two more, and then you're all ready to dress up. If you have more questions, just come to me and talk, and thank you so much.